This episode of Capes and Lunatics is brought to you by Tweaked Audio. Get awesome headphones, go to tweakedaudio.com and use the coupon code SOUTHGATE to get 30% off, free shipping, and a lifetime warranty. Or you can get there through the link on our website, southgatemediagroup.com. This is Luca Perrick, and you're listening to the Capes and Lunatics podcast. Recording has started. Hello, dear friends, and welcome once again to Super Connectivity. I am your host, Charlie, the Professor, as they call me. Asa, and with me, as always, is the Blue Eyed Palmer from the Burg of Pits. Phil, fill me in, Perch. Fill me in, Phil. How's life treating you? Pretty good. How about you? Uh, that's pretty good. I, I got to be honest with you. I'm actually feeling very positive right now. We're going into the year of the ox, oh, which is my year. Ah, ox, nice. good. Yeah, that's actually a fun fact because I'm born in January, which oh. actually means I am in the the lunar astrological year predating what everyone says the year is. So as we enter the year of the ox, that year of the ox will run through my birthday next January. So this is my time of power. And I feel that power every day. For I am strong like ox, and I will be the ox. That's my goal for this year. And then next year it won't be the year of the ox anymore. And, you know, it falls away. But uh, happy Lunar New Year, Phil. Happy New Year. Yes, I don't know exactly what day the Lunar New Year starts. I just know it's after my birthday, so <laughs> that's why I'm always the year before. I think it was this week sometime. Yeah, it's, it's no, I know it's this week sometime. Oh, wow, Wesley's wearing brown today um, on uh, Star Trek the Next Generation. He just sort of just walked into the scene. Um, <laughs> oh, Will Wheaton, we love you so. Um, so, Philip. Charles? Okay. Justin wants to go to bed, so he needs to put his glasses away. He wants me to put them somewhere. It's okay. It's not a problem, son. Um, so, uh, let's talk Lawrence Fishburne. Oh, okay. Real quick. Yeah, you know, you got to start where, the, where, where, where they're interesting. So, there's going to be another... There's going to be another... Animated inter- interpretation of the Beyonder, and I'm hoping this one's good. Um, now, for those who don't know, so there have been like two other animated interpretations of the Beyonder that I know of. The first one was in the, I want to say it was the '90s Spider-Man series where they did a Secret War arc and they had the Beyonder yeah. in it. Yeah, yeah, and then there was another one in the latest Avengers continuity of Marvel shows. And this will be a new one. And that's interesting to me. Because this is a Marvel animated universe coming while the Marvel Cinematic Universe is being established as the one universe. The 616 of our reality. Which makes me wonder is this Lawrence Fishburne Beyonder that will be a part of the Moon Girl and Devil Dinosaur series, which is apparently going to be an animated series, is this going to be the Beyonder for R616? I don't know how much it's going to uh, interact with, like, like the Disney Plus stuff, because this is on the Disney Channel, you know, like where, like, that Spider-Man cartoon is and uh, Mm -hmm. Avengers and that, so I don't know if it's going to be set in that universe. It might be set in that universe. So that's a possibility. But arguably, there's going to be this effort to... Now that Foggy is the one the one to rule them all, Foggy is the one ring, it opens up a possibility here. You know, that if they do decide to bring in a Beyonder into the MCU, will that be Lawrence Fishburne? And as people have pointed out, this is Fishburne's third Marvel role. Because he was the voice of uh, Silver Surfer. He was, of course, the great Bill Foster. Mm-hmm. 
apparently the original giant man in, in the MCU continuity. And now he will be the Beyonder. Well, again, I and, mean, just just like with Silver Surfer, even if they did bring in live action Beyonder, if he's, if he's all CGI, Fishburne can do the voice. That would be kind of funny if they, like, have him be Chris Evans. <laughs> But just always Lawrence Fishburne's voice coming out of Chris Evans' mouth. With it's that white, funny. With that white tracksuit, yeah. Yeah, you know. Oh, I want. Yeah, I here's what it, I want to see: Chris Evans with the Captain Neo hair. Mm. That is. That's all I want. That's all I want right now. Um, yeah, I'm excited that they're going to be bringing in a. Um, a Beyonder into this latest incarnation of the Marvel Universe. I, I'm glad we're getting another Beyonder. I want more Beyonders. I'm hoping they're going to touch into who the Beyonder really is. Yeah. Because that's the thing. I feel that the only theory that makes logical sense is my own because I made it up. And it, therefore, it's better. Um, which is that the Beyonder was the one all being it. That there was a universe that was an infinite universe. And there's the thing. If you have infinite universes with infinite possibilities, blah, 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 there would be this one inf universe that was just one thing. All space, all time, all everything. Completely one thing. My own, I actually have a secondary theory that that universe was actually the universe nullified by Korvac in... Uh, a certain what if comic that I even forget what it was because they actually revisit it later. And when you go to it, it's like, oh, it's the blank space that the Beyonder's in. But it's really just the white space. But the idea that there was a universe that all time, all space, all everything was just one unified nullification, one thing. And then suddenly it has a sentience that peers through to another universe. And it enters that universe, and then you get a universe inside a universe, and now suddenly that universe is now replicating. Because, of course, the other universes aren't a single unified universe. That other universe exists on a space-time continuum. So it is constantly separating and divulging, which means that all the other universes tied to this all other everything are all throughout it, which is freaking nuts when you think about it but um it's cool and i think that's what the beyonders are and that is why they refer to the first beyonder that we know as a juvenile beyonder because he was the first beyonder even though the other beyonders came before him mm -hmm. it's like doctor who timey-wimey stuff so that first beyonder who is trying to understand what it is to be something multiple and that's why the other beyonders have all these thoughts and plans just like if you read secret wars 2 the beyonders all these thoughts and plans and ideas oh this is how i'm gonna make everything back to the way it was it never works because you can't put the toothpaste back into the tube and that's the story i always really want to be explored with the beyonder i want someone to really like break down the beyonder and say yeah you see the problem is once the genie is out of the bottle, he can't go back into the bottle. It's not that the genie doesn't want to go back to the bottle. It's that he has been, he's left the garden. Once you leave the garden, the garden is pretty awful. And because that's the thing. It's like if you were to suddenly go to the Garden of Eden, and it's like, oh, look, there's all these fruit trees. I can eat, I can eat and I can sit. And dang, I'm bored. Can we get a PlayStation? Can we get a something in here? It's like, no, it's the garden. It's the Garden of Eden. It's like, yeah, but what if we had like, you know, more snakes, and that is the thing. Oh, look, they're letting uh, Wesley sit behind the uh, calm while Jordy flies. This is all season one stuff. Okay, so yeah, I watch. Yeah, as I do this show, I watch Heroes and Icons in the background because it's it's helpful to me to have a lot of distractions while I talk because it helps me to focus. Um, so now that we've gotten that out of the way, <laughs> your thoughts on on uh, Lawrence Fishburne coming back to the Beyonder? I can't. I can't wait to. Uh, uh, I was going to say see it, but uh, hear his performance. I'm sure it's been, you know, like all of this, oh, all yeah. of great. Yeah. Honestly, yeah. The Beyonder. He's always a great character. Now, 
I didn't like the as much as I like my wax mustache. I didn't like them giving the wax mustache to the Beyonder in the latest Avengers run because it was way too much like the Stranger. Mm-hmm. And as we know, the Stranger and the Beyonder, there is a weird relationship with them. But I almost feel trying to make the Beyonder the Stranger is trying to take away from the Beyonder mm-hmm. and trying to take away from the Stranger. Because the Stranger, actually, as has been established in previous continuity, was supposed to be the fourth face of the Living Tribunal. Bum, nope. bum, bum. <laughs> I don't know, it was a book I read once, and that's what they said, and so I take that as canon, because if it, I read it, and then it was there, it was real when I saw it, and so it's real. But yes, <laughs> that's who the stranger is supposed to be. <laughs> he is, and he, you know, and interestingly enough, much like my yelling about the Griever in Fantastic Four, mm-hmm. the stranger is the same way, a infinite cosmic entity that's way too petty, and way too small, and the things he does. Oh, yeah. But then again, when you think about it, that's exactly what the Beyonder is, too. The mm-hmm. Beyonder is an infinite being, but he's always like, no, 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 let's, let's, what if we do this? So let's, can, can we tweak it? Can we fix it? Can we, you know, they, they haven't learned the lesson that Darren Stevens taught me years ago when Darren was thinking, maybe if I let Samantha use her powers to help our house, help us out and help our lives, he like founds his own agency and does this whole thing. And there's this thing where she like puts, his name on the door that says Darren Stevens advertising in gold leaf. And, um, look, and, uh, Samantha says, do you want me to make it platinum? And he says, no, 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 don't tamper with perfection. It was exactly where it needed to be. You don't need to go beyond it. You have to be willing to be comfortable with what you have. But anyway, that's just a connection, a super connection. All right, getting back to the story. Um, so WandaVision dropped, of course. Yeah, yeah. And I will talk about this more with Maz. I will hold back secret nuggets. I will not give to Phil. Oh. Maz's nuggets, yes. Um, but I will give a few hints in this and a few thoughts. Uh, and I'll give you the big one. The big one is um, everything I've said so far has been proven correct. There is nothing that has been shown that disproves everything I said. And Hayward's the villain. Hayward is the bad guy. But I will say this. Hayward is trying to do what he thinks is right. But like all fascists, what he thinks is right is actually wrong. I think Hayward set the whole thing in motion. And then it it snowballed out of his control. And that's that, you know, now he's trying to kill Wanda and be like, you know, so no one finds out his part. And he's like, you know what? I can't control her. So we can control anything. He can't control anyone. And that's his problem because he is a guy who wants to be in control. And this is an interesting thing because, you know, I always said he's too nice. Mm -hmm. He's too nice. And that's how I (laughs) No, because that's when he was being a bad guy and trying to deal with things. But as we can see, as it all starts to cascade, cascade out, as it all cascades out, you did see the file that Darcy finds, right? Yeah. What was the file titled? I didn't think it was Cascade. Wasn't it uh, Cataract? or? Oh, it was Cataract. That's right. Oh. Sorry. I was paying attention. It was Cataract. You are correct. But <gasps> in my defense, Cascade and Cataract mean the exact same thing. Oh, my God. It just hit me. What is a Cataract? Isn't it an enemy of vision? I mean, sort of. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> so what a Cataract is, is a Cataract is a waterfall. Same as a Cascade is a waterfall. And we call an optical cataract a cataract because it blurs the vision in the same way that a a, a cataract, a waterfall, basically a cataract is a small waterfall, so it's all white water, so you can't see through it. So that's essentially why we call cataracts cataracts, 
Because at some point, some scientist was like, oh, you know, that reminds me of those, like, those little cataract falls I saw in the mountains the other day. So yeah, I call this a cataract, and that's that's how we call, like, we call cataracts, cataracts. But yes, but the idea of the... So, yeah, so ah, you caught me on that, Phil. Um, but the, the idea is the same. As the situation cataracted out... Um, because I think that's what I think that's what we're dealing with here. I think that there was a super weapon devised by Hayward. I think he either wanted to weaponize Wanda or use her to create <laughs> a, a pleasant hill. I mean, my actual thinking is no. He want my my actual belief is he wanted to create a essentially a poor man's ultimate nullifier. Mm. He said that you know all these people got snapped. So sort of sort of sort of what. What um, Hawkeye's arc was is like all these people got snapped, but it was random. There are so many people who really should have been snapped who weren't. Oh, I thought I thought we harness snapping technology. I thought it was more along the lines like, yeah, because of the snap, you know, we couldn't kill Thanos, but you know, maybe we could have dropped him in this uh, pit of, oh, I don't remember who I am. So guess what? I'm not going to snap. See, the problem with that is it's a little too subtle. Because that's my thing. I don't think that what's happening... Here's what else... When you talk about, like, who's in control of Westview, and it's like, oh, well, Wanda's in control of Westview, right? Well, maybe, maybe not. Wanda may be the person... It's sort of like when you say, you know... So here, here's the idea. I'm driving a car. I'm in control of the car. But there's ice on the road. And I'm going to do things to keep us stable as we're dealing with the ice on the road that you may think, well, why are you doing that? You're in control. Why aren't you just doing what I think you should do and drive straight? It's because there's ice on the road and I'm trying to drive this car through this. This is a very scary time for me. There is snow and ice everywhere. I have two feet of visibility. And if I stop, I'll probably get snowed in and not be able to get out. So right now, I'm trying to move forward. And all these distractions aren't helping. And that is my take, because I my honest belief is, is that here's my actual honest belief that I've sort of, this is, this is a thin fan theory, a thin theory that the re, the repatriation of vision technology from Wakanda was done illegally, first off, obviously, and was done expressly to lure Wanda in. Hmm. Because what they wanted was they needed an Omega level threat and they couldn't get Thor and they couldn't get the Hulk. So we needed an Omega level threat that can test out this new technology based on everything we've been able to assess about the infinity stones to create a weapon that can nullify anything essentially. And in fact, I will wager they are going to call it the ultimate nullifier <laughs> or the pen. They'll call it the penultimate nullifier. <laughs> Cause they wanted something that could snap a threat. Yeah. Because let's face it, if you're a military person and you see a weapon that could make something go away, say, I didn't think that was a possibility. Let us try that. How could we make that thing? Because this is what I always say, you know, and this is what I said in 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 uh, Capes and Lunatics this week, you know, humans are messed up. As a species. Now, honestly, maybe all species are messed up, but of course, as humans, when we create a species, they are an idealization of something about us. Mm -hmm. We never really give them that complexity because that would be too hard to write. It's very hard to write humans in general, and mm -hmm. it's all you can do to write humans to be realistic, let alone alien cultures. So always the aliens come to Earth, and then they face earth and then suddenly humans are like well this is a technology we could steal 
and manipulate and make into our own. So when, which is not for nothing, exactly what Tony Stark did. Like literally exactly. He's like, oh, there's a technology that can do this? Well, then I should do that too. And I'll make the exact same thing. I'll reverse engineer the Infinity Gauntlet that Itri gave us because I'm sure at, by, at some point Itri brought over yeah, this is the mold for it. This is how we make it. This is what we do. So, man, I want that scene with little Pete, Peter Dinklage and Tony Stark just sitting there. Oh, yeah, so here's how I make my things. Here's here's the tech behind it. Here's how this tech works. It's like, oh, wow, that's cool. Think, oh, that's like you. I'm going to call this Stark tech and patent. It's like, yeah, what do I care? You're on a completely different planet, and all of my people are dead. So, ah, uh, life sucks for me. Like, well, come to MIT. You can be a teacher at MIT. And then it's like Hogwarts. MIT becomes Hogwarts in the Marvel Universe. That'll be fun. That'll be fun. Wouldn't you love to see a scene with Peter Dinklage as e tree as a professor of engineering oh, at yeah. MIT? I want this story. I want a wacky sitcom of e tree the Dwarf at MIT in the MCU 616 teaching Riri Williams about things but there's something, but there's something about the vision's body either he's the problem or he's the solution because they mentioned at least two or three times in this episode oh the, his if I, he's a vibranium synthesoid or you know vibranium's body's made out of vibranium and it's they keep bringing up that vibranium well vibranium is like a magic metal it's like uru you know mm -hmm. it's a metal that we can attribute anything we want to at this moment you know, like, vibranium is not even really technically supposed to be solid. It's like, it's weird, the things they do with vibranium. In, in fact, like, you're not supposed to even make be able to make a vibranium steel alloy like Captain America's steel, uh, Captain America's shield, because by its nature, vibranium is supposed to just melt all other metals. So... That's a thing, yeah. I mean, obviously the vibranium is important because it's vibranium in the MCU. We don't have adamantium, so we made everything vibranium. Yes. Um, you know, and, you know, it has whatever powers it needs to have, like all good super metals. You know, it's like Kryptonian steel. What is Kryptonian steel? I don't know, but it works, and Superman can't break it. Yep. So there, that's all it needs to do. I never understood if it was like a steel krypton, krypton, kryptonite alloy that just weakened him enough that he couldn't break it, or it was actually like a steel made by Kryptonians that was just so dense Kryptonians couldn't break it. But Kryptonians, well, in some versions, didn't have super strength on their own world. Although, actually, on their own world, they actually were supposed to have super speed and other things like that because they were all supposed to be super. Right, Kryptonians? In the comic strip version, yes. No. Which was written by, um, uh, I forget if it was uh, Siegel or Schuster who wrote the comic book or the comic strip. But yeah, in the comic strip, it is established that the Kryptonians all had superpowers like Superman. It wasn't the yellow sun. It was just, they were just super beings. Hmm. They have since worked away from that, although at the same time, they've also kind of double back on it because you always see that there's never any like weak or like, like every Kryptonian's a super soldier. <laughs> You've never seen a fat Kryptonian, you know, never seen like, the, <laughs> like I don't want to, I don't want to do that today. I'm going to just chill. I'm like, no, I play video games. That I'm a computer nerd Kryptonian. Why do I want to be buff and ripped when I could just sit here and eat nachos? Um, <laughs> For real. I mean, even in the Kryptonian, uh, I, I didn't actually watch all the episodes. Because maybe there was a fat Kryptonian on the Krypton series. I don't know. But <laughs> the idea was is that they but they were all supposed to have, like, super speed. We all be faster than a speeding bullet. And maybe Superman is even more faster because of the yellow sun, which ties into my own fan theory about Kryptonian physiology, which is that there is a structure within Kryptonian all Kryptonian cells it means even even like Kryptonian dogs have this cell that mm -hmm. basically synth that would take in solar energy and turn it into physical energy because they had a cold red sun and so life couldn't exist if they didn't have this specific structure, which I think ties to kryptonite, and that's why kryptonite is deadly. 
because it it, it has essentially a reverse polarity. That's that's my take on it. That what it gives off it it is at a one half wavelength different to the energies within a Kryptonian cell that gives it the power. This is complete speculation. This is not canon, but please say it is canon so that it becomes canon because that's how canon works. Oh. Anyway, moving right along, what were we talking about? We were talking about WandaVision <laughs> and uh, Hayward's ultimate nullifier weapon, which we don't know exists yet, but I guarantee you is going to be a thing. It <laughs> may not be called the, the penultimate nullifier. Take a drink. It may not be given a name like that because they may be holding that out. But I got to feel that after the snap, the first thing a guy like Hayward, who is a military authority person at S.W.O.R.D., who now has power, says, I want to know how all these people got snapped. I want to make our own way to snap things because this is the thing. Hayward is going to say, how do we snap the things we don't want? Not, how do we bring back all that was lost? Because he's a villain. And mm -hmm. that's what differentiates him from a Tony Stark. Because Tony Stark will say, I want to bring people back. And Hayward says, don't care, don't know, want to kill more people. Nope. And that's what they created. They created a weapon that could essentially, in a limited area, snap things. And they fired it at Wanda. And what they fired at Wanda, unfortunately, because Wanda is a sentient, superpowered being who was also empowered by the same energies, was able to take it. And although she started to snap away, she then, because for what it's worth, had already been snapped and snapped back, was able to find her sense of self and pull reality back to her. Because that's the idea, the idea that things exploded out from her. And then she had to bring it back. And when she brought it back, that's when she created Westview. And my honest feeling is, is that Westview, the Westview anomaly exists because she's trying to hold it together. And she's trying to get to the point where things can stabilize. You're getting way too deep into this. Hayward hey, tried to... Tried, tried to mind control her mind control her in the beginning and it went and it went off the rails now he's just I mean, that be a thing too but the thing is we know he stole vision so why did he still vision well, she stole vision no he stole vision he's we know he stole vision okay it's all about words what one says and what one doesn't say as my mother used to say the biggest word in the English language is if. That whenever you see the word if in any written document, you know that means not. Because it's saying if this happens, that happens. Or and, or he wanted the vision, and that's part of the reason she stole him and did this, to protect him. But that's the thing. Okay. When we see the vision, he's disassembled. Now, yes. Granted, Yes, I totally feel he wanted to disassemble the vision. And I think, as I've said, I think Maria Rambeau is what kept it away, which is why he gave her cancer and why her cancer came back. I think that literally it is a situation where this guy who has been evil and using evil things and doing evil things is being evil. It's like, gee, this guy who seems super evil probably is very evil. Um, and we saw that last episode. We saw that this episode because he's getting angrier and angrier. And that's the thing about evil people in fictional stories. The more evil they need to be, the less control they have. So the – the um, as the uh, – you know, that he can be reasonable when there's not a lot on the line. But as soon as he realizes everything about his situation is going to implode, essentially, to, to put it to you really simply, I think he was sending, um, when he sent Monica there, it was literally to get rid of her and hoping that it would have just been, oh, this is a sad Westview anomaly. I guess we'll just have to let it be. 
But is once he realizes that Wanda's alive in there. So essentially, I think from Haywood's per- perspective, the fact that they could get nothing out of Westview that could just be just a mystery dot, one more mystery dot in New Jersey, he was fine with that. It or, was she, or Monica was a guinea pig. Well, eh, possibly. Uh, the, I mean, I don't know yet because they haven't revealed all Because wasn't, wasn't she the first one to get through that field? Well, she was the first. Per- That's an interesting thing. Because when she goes there, Jimmy says, don't you feel it? It doesn't want us to enter. Yeah. And what that tells you is either one of two things. One is that Wanda wanted her to enter, even if unconsciously. Well, yeah, because doesn't Monica even say that? The word, what was that, episode three? She's like, you you, you know, you want me or... Or even yeah. when she, yeah, she's like, you, you know, you wanted, you know, you wanted me in there. You, you looking for an hour? That's, that's the thing that 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 is what is that is why I say Wanda isn't in control. Everything that's happening is unconscious, but I don't think it's be, I don't think it's gonna be. That's the thing. Every time Marvel does this, it was just well in the comics it says she did this because she's a crazy lady. It's yeah. like yes, but Marvel doesn't ever do things. No. The way it happens in the comics. Like the closest you ever get is that Tony Stark was in a war zone when he got stuff in his uh, his heart. But even that gets changed a lot in its interpretation. And everything about it changes. Mm-hmm. So anyone looking to House of M or anything about Wanda's past, you can get a cute Easter egg, but you're not going to get a story. Because no. I get the feeling, the thing that Marvel says is, look, here are all the stories we've told about these characters in these situations. We want this situation to happen, but it has to be a different story. It can't be the same story. It has to be something new. It has to be a new idea that we didn't think of at the time. And not for nothing, because a lot of these stories were written 30, 40, 50 years ago. Yeah. Let's face it, kids. Um, when someone, when some young kid approaches it, it's like, "Wow, man, why didn't they do this?" Oh, because we didn't think that way back then. Because, sort of like, you know, when when Banner and Shuri are talking in uh, Infinity War, and Banner is talking about how the how each item was, how, how each aspect of the Mind Stone was individually. What, how each neural network was individually attached. He said, why didn't you just create you know, a self-replicating fractal nanobot? Now, first off, and just to give you how deep that's supposed to be, yeah. it's not even Banner who did it. That was that was Ultron's design. I know. And so Banner's like, we just didn't think of it. And he goes, well, I guess Ultron didn't think of it, but they weren't even going to go there, which is to, to Banner's credit. It's like, I don't know, man. I just, we didn't think of it. It wasn't how it worked out. Okay. So you're smarter than me. That's fine. Let's try and fix it. <laughs> Can we use that to undo it? And it's like, yeah, probably we could. And that's what they try to do. You know, um, it's, and I think that's what we have going on here. But of yeah. course, we also get the fact that this is what is interesting. In this episode, we realize that Vision is set to factory defaults. He had a hard reboot, reset to factory settings, because Agnes calls out the Avengers in this. And he says, Yes, I am Vision. What's an Avenger? Yep. And then Agnes does her cackle, all is lost, all is lost. Well then before that she asked him, she goes, she goes, Am I dead? And he goes, Why? Oh, yeah. she, well, you're dead. Well, yes. Well, exactly. And that's 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 because and it is interesting. And there's a little line there where um Vision says, You're lost in a town you grew up in. And she doesn't really give an answer to that. And I think there's mm-hmm. going to be a thing there. Oh, I didn't grow up here. I kind of grew up in Salem, Massachusetts. Um, 
not far from New Jersey, by the way. Uh, but I do get the idea that, yeah, I do think that we got a lot more of the this is Agatha Harkness vibe in this episode. In fact, I'm gonna I'm gonna just throw this out. If we do get a Fantastic Four thing in this, like that's an interesting because obviously next episode we will see the aerospace engineer who was referred to in a female uh, with female nouns in the previous episode. In if you look at uh, the translation into a language that has uh, gendered translations, gendered mm-hmm. words. She is called. She's used. She is used words that is that are female. Although in this episode, Moniker says my guy is here, but of course, obviously, guy people do say can be gender neutral. Obviously, other people disagree. But um, you know that's a whole thing. But the idea here's the thing. It would not surprise me if, when it's all said and done, we see Agnes there. And she says to whoever that aerospace engineer is, well, you know, if you ever need a babysitter, I'm great with kids. No. Wink. Um, <laughs> waiting for that scene. Because as we all know, Agatha Harkness first appeared as Franklin's nanny. Yep. and Which I always loved as a concept because it was literally the idea of Reed Richards saying, I have all these enemies. All my energies, enemies are science-based. What is something that eludes science? Magic. Let me find a magic person to be my nanny. Because I need someone that can deal with the wingless wizard. Who, Which, incidentally, that's my little side theory. I would not be surprised if the actual aerospace engineer is Bentley. Oh, jeez. Because he would be a guy that you might describe as an aerospace engineer, as this guy. He's always up for a challenge, and so and it could even be Wilma Bentley in well, this situation. Yeah. You know, and it's like, oh, well, I'm just Bentley, man, and just this crazy lady who loves to do crazy science. Uh, Tristan wanted me to mention his fan theory about this, also, just mm-hmm. for fun. When they first talk about piercing the um, anomaly, there's all this talk about the radiation and how that might, or, that may or may not protect um, uh, Monica from yeah. having her mind wiped. But here's the thing: when the agent Franklin goes into the anomaly and becomes a beekeeper, he continues on his way. Yep. He doesn't become a... He doesn't lose his sense of self. And he comes up as a beekeeper, and then he's sent back. Now, we don't know what happened to him, and it's possible that either he was kicked out of the anomaly like, uh, like, uh, um, like Monica, or he was sent back into the sewers and now he's just wandering the sewers but maybe is still self-aware hmm. and as tristan pointed out at the end of this episode spoilers when the anomaly expands and turns everything into a circus some of those people were wearing hazmat suits yeah and are their minds protected as well now that they're hmm. in it things have been restructured but they know who they are but other people don't. Hmm. So it's a possibility. Maybe they're going to reconnect with Franklin. Like I said, they gave the agent Franklin a name. So at some point, either he is somebody's cousin who says, no, I want my character to have a name. We well, had a line at some point that they had to attribute to him that they got cut. But he has a name as Agent Franklin. Mm-hmm. So I think we are going to see Agent Franklin again. And I think there may be a, an idea that his mind wasn't r- warped because he was in the hazmat suit. Um, but we'll see. We'll see what happens with the aerospace engineer. We'll see what happens when they try to pierce the anomaly again, 
after it's been reinforced by Wanda, as now that, that it has expanded. Although we already see that Wanda is being pulled to the breaking point. But of course, if you have your magic, uh-huh. you don't die. Mm-hmm. And that's the thing. And I kind of feel as much as people are going to look at that commercial and say that is Billy, I'm going to say that is Wanda. Maybe, yeah. And it is literally that when she was hit by the weapon that Hayward used, which we will find out about later, mark my words, she was going to die. And everyone was going to die. And she had to find her magic. Yo, magic. Find your magic, woman. Find your magic and save everybody. Wait a minute. I mean, look at this series. I mean, we've gotten Sokovia, her brother, the vision. I mean, we've gotten, I mean, mentions of everything. I mean, is she, is she maybe technically dying? Is her life flashing before her eyes? It's a possibility, and that, but that again goes to my idea that she, you know Hayward tried to kill her. Mm-hmm. Someone tried to kill her, and now this is where she is. Anyway, do you want to talk comic books, Phil? Because we got a few left here. Sure. Okay. Um, hey, hmm. you want to talk Taskmaster real quick? Did you get the chance to read Taskmaster? I did not read Taskmaster. Tell me about Taskmaster. Well, if nothing else, there's an Easter egg that shows that everyone at Marvel listens to our podcast, and they're always looking for ways to get um, get uh, uh, mm-hmm. Easter eggs from the Southgate Media Group network into it, because, of course, at some point, um, Taskmaster says, let's see if we can get this panel in there. So can you read that? It's this one here. No, I can't see it. Okay. It says, but mark my words. Oh, um, oh nice. Yeah, nice. because essentially he realizes that he's being played, which he knows. Oh, by the way, by the way, there's a South Korean Superman. This is the first time I've seen him. I love him. I want more of him. I wish his uniform wasn't white because it's so generic. I know he's basically... Well, no, because the South Korean flag is the red, blue, yin yang, with on the white background. But dang, if he doesn't look like Pepsi Man. And yeah. um, to be fair, you could have used the colors in a different way. As you'll notice, Captain America is mostly blue, mm-hmm. even though most of the American flag is. Red and white. So you could use the red and white and blue motif in the South Korean black flag with hints of black and done his uniform a little bit better. You do see he does have like the black on his shoulders, but those don't even look like the proper hashtags for it, you know, and they really should be on his hips too because you have it in the four corners on the South Korean flag. But, um, but he's cool. He's a Superman because every country needs a Superman. Oh, yeah. And he is part of the um, the Tiger Division. That's, he identifies himself. He's a good cop. He identifies himself and uh, flies back to the base. Uh, but he, you know, a great point in here about how, how, how um, Taskmaster has instituted a no-Nazi policy. Sorry, <laughs> Nazis. Even Taskmaster is calling you out. We are done with you Nazis. Go home. And this is what is interesting because he actually, and this is what's interesting about Taskmaster as he's looking at director, I believe her name is Amy Han. He says, you know what? I'm seeing her and I'm realizing her. She's not human. She's trying to emulate being a human. But it's like, he says, it's like Hyperion. She's not a human. And of course, that's because she's actually a Kitsune. Because we do see him out her when they fight, and there's a great it's a great callback to a lot of a lot of things that they do in um, comic books where they have the uh, writing 
of what this move is. So, oh yeah, Shang Chi. If you read a Shang Chi, which by the way, I love, I love Shang Chi books. They're great. Um, I say, like, you know, they'll describe the fight he's doing. They did that also with Doctor Strange at one point, where they would like say, you know, invokes the you know cytoractic, you know, deregulation. Um, and but this is just all that punch I once saw that one time, and there's this kick that Iron Fist does, and this is that thing that that Cap did when he threw me out a window. Um, so it's a lot. That is a funny aspect that is fun, but also story important. So I really appreciated that. We realized that. Um, hey, you know who Marvel's Batman is? Taskmaster is Marvel's Batman. Thank you very much. Because yeah. apparently he was injecting the crazy doomsday cult people with a super soldier serum that would do what he wanted it to do when he wanted it to, which was send off a psychic blast to inca incapacitate everyone in the building except him because he had his psychic baffles on, which is just beautiful. Um, he decides... Ain't worth killing the Black Widow because she might wake up and also she's been dead before. So if I kill her, it might just make her angry. So he just writes on the wall, scratches on the wall, on the, on the wall I didn't kill Maria Hill! Stop chasing me! Oh, I love Taskmaster. This is such a good book. And next week or next month in Wakanda. Oh, that's going to be fun. <laughs> What's the book and you read, Phil? I was going to say, well, speaking oh. of speaking of Taskmaster, he was in uh, Thun Thunderbolts 2 is out this week, too. Oh, yes, it was. Yes, it was. And I read that. Where did I put that? Oh, there it is. Here's our Tony. And he puts his mask back on. Oh, this is good. Man, this is... This is interesting. Mm -hmm. This is maybe one of my favorite Thunderbolts versions ever. And you tie this into what we see in, honestly, I'm going to tell you, as much as I hate symbiotes, as much as I see Null as just such a stupid, lame character, um, the stories of the people dealing with this stupid, lame situation oh, yeah. are so freaking compelling. And you look at, like, you look at Daredevil and... Fisk actually, like, you know, they told me to evacuate, and I thought I didn't believe them, you know, which I'm sure so many people didn't believe, you know, and everyone said, oh, no, what, the Avengers didn't solve that? And, you know, I remember that with the incursions. Back to the incursions. And Deadpool said, wait, oh, the incursion is happening? Didn't the Avengers fix that already? What the heck? Well, I mean, um, even, but Fisk, too, he's like, you know, I've been the enemy to how many of these people? Why would they tell me the truth? Yeah, but at the same time, you know, within that whole concept, man, you got, I love Wesley. That's the thing, man. For whatever you want to say about the next Netflix stuff, they gave us Wesley. Yes. And Wesley is such an awesome character as Fisk's right hand. And I just... Man, Marvel has to embrace that universe. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the thing. It's like at no point do they should they ever walk away from it. They have to say, yeah. these are our babies, and we don't abandon our babies. That's what makes Marvel great, is that we're going to say, yeah, there's a squirrel girl, and she kicked Thanos' butt. What's it to you? That's our baby. We're gonna make. We're gonna keep her, and she's here, and she's glorious. And that's why Marvel's an ex is an ex inclusive place, you know, because mm -hmm. it doesn't matter if she's a joke character. She is. She kicked Thanos's butt. She's the unbeatable Squirrel Girl, and we're gonna just lean into it, and we're just gonna parade her around until you love her too. And and so it happened. Um, mm -hmm. And so yeah, no, it's kind of cool. Man, I don't know. The whole everybody getting all of their mental illnesses fixed things. Like I said, man, that just totally just seems like like um like that guy just shooting them up with drugs. 
I, I got to be honest with you. It's like, yeah, I just no, man. I just put in time release capsules with like you know antipsychotics, and suddenly all the villains became decent people because they were just so hopped up on antipsychotics. And for what it's worth, in this episode, you really get that vibe from Norman because there's like he's just like he is just so lobotomized in this whole thing. He's just like that's not how I am anymore. I'm trying to be a better person. And it's like, there's, and everyone is like, there's something off with the Green Goblin. Even he says, hey, you want to put on your Green Goblin outfit and join us? He's like, no, I don't think so. Um, Bat Truck being a BA is probably the best thing I've ever seen. I know. Um, especially when he, um, when like uh, who's this guy? Who's Mr. Fear, I guess. Yeah, um, it, an old yeah, Daredevil villain. There's been a couple of them, yeah. Yeah, and just the idea that you know, like, and he's just like mocking, you know, you know Batrock. It's like, dude, I fight Captain America every week. You know, it's like, you know, right now I'm thinking of like what would be the most efficient way to kill you? <laughs> he just does the splits and kicks him in the chin and says. Probably I'll just, uh, you know, rupture your trachea and let you bleed out and die and, and drown in your own blood. Um, and then, of course, you know, that I think is what happens when the dragons start attacking and they all go out and they have their little electricity things. Because apparently they fix themselves for fire, but not electricity yet. What is going on with this? It's like, symbiotes. It's like, oh, they know about our fire stuff, right? Yeah, so let's make a way so we won't be, we will be immune to fire. It's like, okay, we'll do that. It's like, okay, oh, what about electricity? It's like, oh, they won't think about electricity. What are they? Intelligent, adaptive mammals that just figure out things based on trial and error? Unless they can only fix one thing. They can only, can only fix the one thing, man. You know, we, 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 I don't know, did they fix the sound thing? Because it seems like Black Bolt could handle this all pretty well. Or Screaming Mimi, which would be like just as great. Yeah. Here comes Songbird. Oh, and just like, oh, okay, I guess, you know. I'm just waiting for Reed Richards to show up. Um, because for what it's worth, okay, but okay, let's get to this. Because Norman's plan is, you know, the century got ripped in half, right? Yep. But you know what? There's still at least five million exploding suns inside there. Was, oh, yeah. Was he a million or was he ten million? I forget. I forget I, how many exploding suns Sentry's power was. Yeah, so the Thunderbolts are going to try to use his corpse to blow up his corpse. Jeez. Well, the bottom half anyway. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> they were the and that'll solve that problem. But speaking of which, let's talk about Fantastic Four for a minute here, sir. Uh, uh, Sue is a bad sister. I know, has a hard that? time dealing. Has a hard. She's a bit of a. You know, I'm going to say that. I'm going to say this right now. Sue's a Sue's a bit of a toxic personality. Very she has to be in control. Overprotective. I know because, like, when Johnny's like, "You never follow me around on my other dates," she's like, "Oh no, no, of course not." That you know of. Exactly. What? Yeah, it was. It was. It's a little insecure for her. Yeah, it's. I mean, I get what they're doing. They are doing the whole. You can't just fall in love with someone you just met thing from Frozen. Except, first off. You know, Johnny does this every week. Johnny's exactly. always falling in love with someone. So I almost feel like it's this weird thing with 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 Sue being like, oh, this might be real, and now I will lose my brother, and like I need him to be in the subordinate position, which is like not a good look for you, Sue. Though, I mean, to be fair, she was Malice. So maybe that's part of the maybe the maybe they're hinting at the return of Malice. And to be fair, in this episode, there's a lot of Sue turning invisible and running away, very much pre Malice Sue Storm when you think yeah, about yeah. it. And uh, and here's the thing. Basically, I think this is a big misdirect. And you know what? What I think is the big misdirect in this episode, Phil. What? 
when at the very end Reed boosts the signal because that was the problem so they could reach the other Fantastic Four members and they get in touch with Ben and he Ben tells them where he is and Ben says uh, it takes a lot more than goo to get in my head and then we see it and oh no Ben has a symbiote oh no no um, and they even give you Oh, look at this horrible cover. See how Ben is a symbiote now? Oh, cry, because he's going to kill us all, because he's Ben Grimm. What? No, um, Ben Grimm is not possessed by the symbiote. Ben Grimm is covered by a symbiote. That symbiote is there, and Ben Grimm is like, you know, I, like, fought back against the Psycho Man. I live every day inside my head with all ki- It's sort of like Typhoid Mary over in Daredevil. It's like, you really do you want to take over our brains, but you really don't know who you're dealing with. You think, oh, we will just wear you down, <clears throat> and eventually we will control you. It's like, no, dude. Uh-huh. Um, we're super adaptive mammals, and we will do what we want to do, not what you want us to do, and that's how that's going to work out. So, yeah, I think at the end... There, Ben's going to show up, and they're going to like, Ben, are you possessed by the null? It's like, no. They're trying to constantly. Voices in the back of my head. But, dude, I've been, I've dealt with voices in the back of my head for years. For God's sake, I'm a freaking walking rock. <laughs> if Dare, That's my thing. Like if Daredevil can resist, oh, Ben yeah. can, can resist. Because not for nothing, physically, just on a physical level, Ben Grimm has a super soak ability. He can take all the damage and it doesn't matter how powerful you are the more you punch the more he gets up you know he can do this all day yep and that's who ben grimm is that's why that's his power and the fact of the matter is is that they're gonna try and corrupt him now he has been corrupted before you know i remember when he picked up the one hammer they made him into a monster which i did not like because I really wanted him to break that, but okay, so maybe certain gods can do that, but first off, this isn't a god, this is Null, Null's not a god. Mm. Null is at best an eternal, you know, someone created, you know, basically, you know, it's it's sort of like the Klingons say when they, we killed our gods because they were too much trouble. Um, Mm. You know, it's like there's a difference between the gods that are Eternals and the gods that are actually gods who are creating things. Like Gaia is a different kind of god than, um, you know, a guy that everyone thinks is a god. So that's my take on that. And uh, so Gaia is different than Loki, is what I'll say. Like you can go with that pan dimensional stuff, but when you get to a character that is a actual esoteric force, they're a next level up. And I do think that that is what we're dealing with there. And I don't think Null is that. I think that the entire point is that Null is going to get... First off, we know Null is going to get totally owned because he's the bad guy. And so I do think with Daredevil kicking Null out of his head, yes, he had to electrocute himself. But, you know, and again, because he could connect with other humans who could protect him. That is essentially what happened there. That, you know, these things aren't so hard to beat. And for what it's worth, in the Fantastic Four episode, there's a whole thing about, you know, this decompensation field. And, you know, you know, Reed has just enough phlebotinum and, of course, an infinity gate at his disposal. Gee, maybe those will come in handy this episode. What? Mm-hmm. Yes. What if, in, what if we simply um, sent Null to... Go hang out with the Griever at the end of all things and let those two fight it out. That sounds fun. Oh, that might be how they solve it. It's like, no, oh, no, no, don't take the Infinity Gate. Why, that could take you to any point in all of space and time and all dimensions. Why, you could conquer everything if you could get to that door. Of course, only the Fantastic Four can open it. And maybe we will. I'll do it for you. If he gets you off this world, let us have our time today. And he'll go and say, oh, I sent him to the same place we sent the Griever. 
So he's at the end of all things, and now he gets to fight the Griever. And maybe, maybe he wins against the Griever at the end of all things. But you know what? Even if he does, he's still stuck at the end of all things. And what will he do now? Ba 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 ba. Big prediction. All right, Phil. Uh, did you hear me okay uh, this episode, Phil? Mm, kind of. Kind of? Well, that's good. I'm sure you're using the best quality headsets you can find. Uh, of course, right now we're using audio equipment, so we have to have both the audio and the communication. But, you know, a lot of people, they just want to listen. They want crisp, clean audio in their ears. And for those people, I say, go to tweakedaudio.com. Use the coupon code SOUTHKID at checkout. Save yourself a bundle. Get high-quality uh, headphones at half the cost, or maybe, I don't know, but at a cheaper price than those fancy headphones that you're just literally buying because some celebrity made them. It's like, oh, well, a celebrity said these are good, so I'll buy them. Hey, I'm a celebrity, too. Buy these ones. So, and, well, you know, hey, you're, you heard my words. That makes me a celebrity. Oh, there you go. Check and mate. Um, and you know what? If you are listening just fine, maybe you already have your own Tweet Audio headset, why don't you use that same coupon code, even if you've already used it, over at huntakiller.com and help Michelle Grace solve a cold case, get an escape room delivered to your house. Not literally, but in the sense that your mind will be so engaged, you have to find a way to escape to solve it before you can rest. Uh, that'll be fun. Uh, and, of course, none of that really interests you and say, I don't want to buy what you tell me. I want to buy whatever the heck I want. Well, the, you know, I say good for you. Buy whatever the heck you want. Don't listen to me. But do go to the show notes. Click on the Amazon link and go to Amazon.com where you can literally buy anything you freaking want for the most part, including Pod Life, the book, the book written by the Podgate, uh, by the Southgate Media Group, Media Group family. We wrote this book. We wrote it for you so you could understand what it means to be a podcaster, how and why, and how it saves our lives, all of us. And it's a good book to read. You can get it in that, like, you know, classic hardbound wood pulp paper edition, or you can be fancy and get it in that digital download, just like in The Matrix. And those are our sponsors. And now, if you'd like to talk to us, me and Phil, Phil, how can they find you? Uh, you can always email us, capesandlunatics at gmail.com, or call the voicemail, 614 382 2737. That's 614 38 capes. And you can find links to all of our social medias, the Facebooks, the Twitters. You can find a link to the YouTube channel so you can see Charlie Usser's pretty face. Uh, Everything's at Linktree, L-I-N-K-T-R dot E-E slash Capes and Lunatics. I have a mustache just like Batrock, and that's why I grew it. Because the more I'm like Batrock, the better I am. And, of course, if you'd like to follow me in that old-fashioned email way, where our moms and paws wants to do so at superconnectivityblog at gmail.com. That's superconnectivityblog, all one word, at gmail.com. And that's if you want to write to me and tell me your thoughts. But if you just want to see my thoughts spewed out for all the world to see, Sunday nights at 8, uh, when I live tweet a Batwoman, a woohoo, oh. or Monday nights at 7, when I remember to tweet DuckTales, a woohoo, the final season. At Charlie Esser, that's C H A R L I E E S S E R. Look for the two E's in the middle. For what? For quality. Bing! Thank you, Maz. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that has been another episode of Super Connectivity. I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you've learned. I hope you've grown. And I certainly hope that next week you come back here and super connect with us again. Good night. Good night. I us to get up early in the morning to talk to Lilith. Ooh. Oh, yeah, check out Full Stream Ahead where we're talking WandaVision. I think the first episode dropped today. That's that's right. At the time of this recording. Check, yes, check it out every Friday on the Kirk Mutex or on Super Connected or uh, Nuff Set. <laughs>